Good morning to everyone at uh, the 2013 Smart Procurement World in Johannesburg. Uh, this is John Katorna uh, speaking to you from Sydney, Australia. And uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, one of my passionate topics and that is supply chains. And in particular I want to talk about the design of supply chains in a very volatile world, the sort of world that we're working in now. And apart from, uh, despite the fact that over the last 20 or 30 years we've uh, in a sense, uh, developed our supply chains in a very topsy-turvy way, it's now becoming very obvious that we need to consciously design our supply chains. And the reason for this is that we're moving away from physical logistics networks to talking about broader supply chains which involve uh, customers at one end and suppliers at the other. Um, we're moving from sort of static set-and-forget structures to uh, dynamic uh, uh, structures and we need to have dynamic capabilities embedded in our supply chains. Uh, the other big change that I want to talk to you about today is that we are moving away from designing our supply chains from the inside out and looking at them more from the outside in. In other words, we want to interpret what our customers are, are saying to us and how they want to be serviced and then reverse engineer back into our organisations and design the appropriate responses. The other big change that I want to talk to you about today is this idea of moving away from the one-size-fits-all. Um, for some reason, over the, the last 30, 40 years, there's, be, there's the, been this preoccupation with trying to design a single supply chain for all, for all seasons, as it were. And what's becoming obvious is, is that this cannot happen mainly because there is uh, more than one type of customer. Uh, years ago, post-war, uh, customers more or less had to take what we gave them, but now they are being empowered by the internet and they want to be serviced in different ways and I want to talk to you about how we can cope with that. So we're moving away from this one-size-fits-all to a world of, uh, some people call it tailored supply chains, uh, I'll call it uh, multiple supply chain alignment. Um, the other thing, of course, which is what I've mentioned already, is that we, we definitely have seen the last of what I would call stable environments. I think we are moving into the new reality of uh, instability and volatility. We may have periods of stability in between, but we will not, I don't think, again, see in our lifetime a world of just unmitigated growth uh, where we can just uh, set and forget our particular supply chain structures. And finally, I think the other thing that we're definitely seeing the end of is this idea of managing our companies purely in a functional way. The idea that uh, we manage our various functions vertically and everything will take care of itself. Well, the reality is, is that our customers buy in a different way. They buy a bit of our procurement, uh, they buy some of our finance, some of our logistics capabilities, some of our production, some of our marketing, some of our sales. So they buy horizontally across our organisation and um, whereas we manage our businesses vertically. So the type of functional specialism that we've been using uh, since the Industrial Revolution is now coming to an end and we have to find a better way to manage in the new world. Before I get too far into uh, talking about how we're going to do this, I'd just like to draw your attention to the fact that in a sense there's, there's three levels of, of performance that we can seek to uh, reach in, in our uh, enterprise supply chains. First level, I'll call it operational excellence. And if you listen to a lot of people, you get the impression that that's it. Uh, well, it's not. Um, it's almost a given these days that you can be operationally excellent in your companies, whether it be manufacturing or retailing. And we just need to get all our standard processes and do this, the basic things well and achieve that. Because after a while, the, there's a sort of diminishing returns effect and you cannot get much more um, advantage, if you like, or added value out of improving on operational excellence. At that point, you jump to the second curve. I'll call that management uh, sophistication. And this is where we have to incorporate uh, our what I've already mentioned to you, our design thinking, uh, start thinking about how to segment our customers in different ways in order to link with our enterprise. Uh, we need to think more deeply about our own internal organisation design. We need to think about how we can 
integrate um, our technology in better ways than we've been doing it, much more productively. We need to obviously think about strategic sourcing, which is, I know, something that uh, this audience is very concerned about. Uh, we need to get better at supply chain planning. Uh, we need to think about where to, when to collaborate and not to collaborate. And we need to, in particular, think about how to manage our logistics uh, service providers. So they're the sorts of things that will take us to that next level um, of uh, excellence or next level of supply chain performance. Those two together really are the ones that I'm going to focus on today uh, because between the two of those levels, they add up to uh, the, the, the components of what I call supply chain alignment. Beyond that, if we want to go to the third and final level, level of um, supply chain performance, we need to start going well, well beyond the externalities of our organisation. We need to think about new business models, uh, ways of uh, coming together in consortiums, uh, networks. In fact, that is the way some companies are already going, where they're recognising that you know, in a sense, uh, we're not talking about linear things here. We're talking about networks of companies um, working with other networks of companies. And I think that's the future, but very few companies in the world today are at that point. So I'm going to um, stick with the, the first two levels and see if we can find a better way to align with our uh, customers who are moving all the time, which is one of the reasons why I've uh, called this talk or address uh, dynamic supply chains because we have to give these supply chains the ability to change. I think the, the other thing that we've got to recognise is that um, uh, companies uh, these days are making conscious efforts, both in terms of the, uh, com the, the customers that they're targeting on the, on the one hand and the suppliers that they're working with uh, at the back end. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is really what makes up supply chains, where companies consciously make choices about which suppliers they're going to work with and which customers they're going to work with at the front end. And running through those combinations of companies, there will be pathways, we call them supply chains, and they're marked on this diagram, uh, little white wriggly lines, which are in a sense designed to, to uh, imply that um, our supply chains are more than not just one, as I said earlier, but uh, that all these uh, companies actually have a combination of supply chains or pathways running through them and that cu customers can be serviced along these different routes. I think the, the other thing that I'd like to draw to your attention, which has been somehow lost in the whole translation over the last 30, 40 years, where we've been preoccupied with um, uh, infrastructure and uh, you know, cost productivity uh, and technology in particular, is actually at the end of the day, supply chains are driven by people. And when I talk about people, I mean people at different different points along the supply chain. At the far end, we have customers um, and uh, they are the people who buy the product or service and consume it. And without them, uh, we have nothing. Uh, we may have some intermediaries along the way, um, retailers and distributors of various sorts. They don't consume the product, but they facilitate the movement of the product or service through to the consumer. At the other end, you've got suppliers, and I know a lot of you will be very familiar with them, um, who produce uh, and build and, and design and manufacture very often the components or the sub-assemblies or, in fact, uh, secure the raw materials which are input into the production process. And in the middle, we've got the enterprise that we, we are perhaps uh, involved in, which we, we take inputs from our suppliers and we then convert those inputs into products and services and sell them to our customers or consumers downstream. So in a sense, I would argue that about 50% of the activity that goes on in supply chains actually is to do with human behaviour and human decision making. The other 50% is obviously the infrastructure and the management of that infrastructure, the technology, etc. Uh, but it's, 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 it's a sorry fact that uh, most corporations today, even some of the leading ones, uh, talk a lot about customers but actually don't recognise this fact that it's that human behaviour bit that makes the difference. And until we can understand better you know, how human behaviour 
drives and shapes our supply chains and the performance of our supply chains, we're going to, I think, find it very difficult to go to the, the, the next uh, higher levels of performance. I've already mentioned to you the one size uh, does not fit all, um, and it's because of uh, this one size fits all mentality that, that we've, we've really fallen into the dual problem of over servicing uh, some of our customers and under servicing others and not knowing which is which. Um, this is the major problem, and I would be arguing today that if we can better align our, um, our, our enterprise with our target customers and give them just what they want, no more, no less. We're, we can do two things. We can reduce the cost to serve because we can reduce a lot of the waste of over-servicing and we can improve our top-line revenue and customer satisfaction because we, we will actually be giving people what they want. We won't be disappointing some people and over-servicing others. I suppose uh, um, the nice way to start here would be to, in a sense, give you a sense of where we want to end up today. Um, at the, the top of that diagram, it's really trying to um, uh, depict this one-size-fits-all where we haven't done enough work uh, at the front end on our customers, uh, neither have we done enough work at the back end on our supply uh, suppliers either, but I'll come back to that shortly. And then through the middle, we've got a type of one-size-fits-all um, set of pathways which struggle past the different vertical um, uh, functions that you can see depicted in that top diagram. That's the way the world is today in many corporations and as I said earlier it's going to be very difficult to improve performance till we get past this particular point point. and as I intimated to you earlier organization design on the inside of the business is going to be a big factor in improving our performance just as well as uh, just as much as in many ways understanding our customers and suppliers. Where we want to go is the diagram we've depicted there on the bottom of this diagram, where on the right-hand side we've done some work and um, segmented our customers along buy buying behaviour lines. And what we mean by that is that we want to understand how customers want to buy a particular product category or service category. And there are, there are a range of different buying behaviours, and we'll come back to that. And on the other side, uh, suppliers as well. I, uh, I'll touch this uh, touch this point again towards the end of my presentation but I think there's a huge opportunity amongst uh, uh, procurement people to look at their suppliers in a different way uh, look at them in a very similar way to the way we're looking at customers at the front end try to understand what the selling motivation is of our different suppliers in order to categorize which ones we want to use on various occasions and this goes well beyond the sort of very mechanical uh, st strategic sourcing analyses that have been done uh, up to date. And then if we can work out both ends, uh, you know, which are the limited number of, of customer segments that we want to supply, which are the limited number of supply uh, supplier segments that we want to draw on, and we can connect these two with three or four uh, supply chains uh, that make up the overall picture of, of a tailored supply chain that will give us about an 80% fit uh, to the business. That's what we're seeking to do, driven by a different type of organisation structure, which I'll touch upon shortly. Now, how are we going to get there? Um, I've been working on this since 1989, um, and uh, I've been searching for a way of reconceptualising how enterprises work, because when I looked at, uh, in the early days of logistics and then beyond that into supply chain, I found that there was very little concept conceptual strength and nothing really to build a design on. So myself and my early colleagues went back to uh, basics and we said, uh, you know, how, how does an enterprise, what really uh, makes an enterprise work and how can we improve its performance? And we came up with this idea of alignment. And what we mean when we talk about alignment is um, that there are four things that you've got to uh, line up when, if, you're, if you want to perform on a, on a sustainable basis. And these four things are from right to left there on that diagram. We've got to, to interrogate our marketplace and understand particularly our customer buying behaviour. Number two, we've got to develop um, uh, value propositions to respond to that insight. 
Three, we've got to go inside the organisation and understand that the internal culture of the business has a lot to do with what things are actually delivered into the marketplace as distinct from what we say we're going to deliver. And this interface between strategy and culture is perhaps one of the biggest problems we've got in our enterprise today. And our research shows that uh, up to 60% of what people write down in their business plans uh, is never delivered because, um, you know, people sit around in rooms saying, yeah, 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 but deep down they're saying, no, no, no. And uh, it's because what's being asked of them goes against their individual values and so they have a conflict and therefore they they um, uh, sort of passively resist uh, doing what's asked of them. And finally, leadership style. Um, I've come to the view that uh, leadership in organisations at, diff- at all levels, particularly at the top, is is absolutely the starting point for everything. And in fact, if you look inside the best organisations today, the you know the Apples, the uh, Dells, uh, the Snyder Electrics, um, you you will see that uh, Unilever is another good one that comes to mind. You will see that um, they they are characterised by the fact that leaders, the leaders in those organisations. Uh, which is at the left hand of that diagram, are in touch with their customers, which are at the right. So those two things are pivotal and the things in the middle, the strategies that they use and the particular subcultures they develop are really derived once they understand the two endpoints. Now this particular diagram is only the front end, of course. The mirror image of that works on the back end as we look backwards to our supply base. Now I'm going to speak mainly today about understanding and aligning with our um, with our customers because my view is that if we don't do that, anything we do as we look backwards into our supply base is going to be done in a, in a, in a sense of ignorance. Uh, and that's what worries me about a lot of activity in the procurement area that we're operating at one end of the organisation without being connected into uh, what's happening at the customer end, which is the important end. We'll tie those two together as we come to the end of this presentation. The The common factor in that alignment equation uh, is uh, really human behaviour, because if you think about it, we've got uh, customers, we've got people inside the business, and we've got leaders, all of whom are human. And of course, the only thing that's non-human in that in that four-level model is strategy, but we can find ways to use the similar code. And the, the trick to all this was to uh, develop a, um, a set of metrics or a coding system where we could uh, look and uh, at our, our customers and within a particular market, we could code them up in terms of where their biases were and we could then use a similar coding system uh, in terms of our strategies, our culture and our leadership style. Now this is very important because one of the things that's held up our um, whole development in this area is the very fact that we have developed strong, strong functions in our organisations, all of which operate with different metrics, with different KPIs, and therefore seem to have a different language. What we did is we found a common metric. It's called PADI, uh, the starting, and don't worry too much about what those words mean. Just think of the, um, the actual uh, coding, and I'll explain that to you in a little bit more in later. The point about this is is that uh, there's no such thing as balance and people talk a lot about balance and balance scorecards and everything else and I wish we could burn all those books because they give the, the wrong impression. What, what we're really looking to do in a marketplace as an enterprise as we try to do well with our customers is to look, with, look to group people with similar biases. So are there people in, in our marketplace who are looking for um, some sort of relationship to a brand and, and, and the security that that brings? Uh, are we looking for people who don't care about the brand but just want a good, consistent product or service at a low price? That's something different. Or are we looking for uh, those people to group people who are opportunistic and who look for deals and are looking for speed? That's a different group. Or are we looking, looking for uh, a, to group those customers who looking for something new and innovative and creative, a solution to something and who are therefore prepared to pay a premium price. That's what I mean when I talk about biases in different directions. And 
if you look at this diagram here, it, it sort of indicates very nicely uh, a particular um, um, example of that, where we've got a bias uh, which in, these, in this what we call coded as big P small a. Uh, now we still can see that there are we are looking at customers or a customer with forces pulling them towards the relationship at the top left hand or the innovation at the top right hand. Uh, but the biggest bias is the force pulling them towards opportunism and speed and, and, uh, and getting results. And that's what we call P for, um, uh, for that. And, and a, there's a secondary um, uh, bias there, which we'll call small a, which is all about maintaining some stability and, and uh, keeping a sense of price in there as well. So th this is one of, of up to 16 different combinations you can have uh, when you start looking for biases in a 2x2 two two matrix. So in our work in the field uh, throughout, and we did a lot of consultancy projects in that period from 89 through to uh, the, the mid-2000s, what we observed were that there were up to 16 different combinations of P, A, D, and I. Um, now, you know, in a sense, that means that there's 16 different supply chains are needed here, but, and that's a bit frightening because we don't want to go from one extreme to the other, from, from the extreme example where there's one size fits all to the other extreme, which is, you know, there are 16 different segments, therefore 16 different uh, supply chains because it's unlikely that we can manage those sorts of numbers of configurations inside our business. The good news is that as we continue to look at situations across a whole range of product, product categories, what we found was that really the ones that came up time and time again, were there were no more than three or four of these. And I've depicted these here. There was the um, collaborative one, the big I, small a, in the middle there in the royal blue or the light blue. Um, that particular segment showed up a lot. We had the big A at the top left and the hand of that diagram, uh, which was the, uh, I, it's called efficient there. I've now changed that name to uh, transactional, but these are the customers that are looking for lowest price, reliable service. Um, there was... Uh, Others like this individual solutions one, the golden colour at the middle of the right, uh, where people are looking for an innovative solution to a problem. And there was probably the other one, the dynamic down there, the big P, small a at the bottom uh, in the red. Um, these, these are the ones that we saw most evidence of. And in fact, just to give you a bit more detail on these, um, We've, I've given you this chart. And interestingly enough, these are the similar sorts of selling behaviours that you will see amongst your, um, uh, amongst your suppliers, those of you who are in, in the procurement uh, business. But again, sticking with our customers at the moment, uh, we see in many markets uh, customers who are collaborative, who are genuinely collaborative. If I don't mean you know people who say they're collaborative and, of course, behave in a different way, but people who generally want to work closely with you either as a business to business or even as a consumer. Uh, and these are characterized by uh, customers who like uh, predictability, they like regularity, they don't like change, they don't tend to buy new things, they tend to buy augmented mature products, they treat you as a primary source of supply, they have a, want to have a trusting relationship with you or your brand or your company. Um, they share information with you in, in, for, in the form of forecasts. They're very forgiving uh, in terms of you making errors or letting them down, uh, and price isn't an issue. And these are the most wonderful customers that you can possibly have. And my first piece of advice is to you and your companies is try to identify those customers amongst your customer base who, who genuinely have these characteristics and put a big fence around them because these are, these are the source of your ongoing business. These give you continuity. These give you a margin. These give you a profitability, and they're most important. But they're spread amongst all your other customers. Geography's got nothing to do with it, and you have to identify them one by one and put them together and treat them in a very respectful way. The navy blue segment there, the big A bias, as I said, I call it, they're calling these transactional now. These are 
similar to the collaborative customers in the sense that they like certainty and predictability, but that's where it all stops. After that, they're not interested in relationships. They tend to uh, source wherever they can. They're very opportunistic and that's, they shop around. Uh, they don't share information. They can be as adversarial um, and they're very price sensitive. So similar in a little way, but uh, beyond that, they're, they're very different. We then move to the dynamic customers, and these are the ones that are causing havoc in most businesses today. Um, they're opportunistic. Uh, they're, they treat us, uh, the supplier, as a commodity. Um, they're uh, all about um, uh, time and everything's a priority. Everything's uh, wanted now. They treat us as an ad hoc source of supply. They, there's no real loyalty there. They come and they go. They jump all over the place, and if you don't watch out, they will uh, screw you down to giving them incredible service at discount prices. And I think you've got to recognise which customers are in this category and take a deep breath, look at them, just tell them what you're prepared to do, but don't let them uh, roll you. And then finally, we've got this other um, type of customer, which is in many ways not a, not a permanent um, condition. Um, any of the other three can move into this particular buying behaviour and move out again if there is a, uh, some sort of emergency. And these are those customers who look for um, some sort of uh, immediate uh, solution to a major problem, a major disruption. It could be a, a DC is burnt down. It could be um, the sort of problems we had some years ago in Europe where the volcanoes uh, stopped a lot of the aircraft flying around, which disrupted a lot of our supply chains. Um, it could be a uh, disruption in our IT system. It could be the sorts of things that happened in Thailand uh, three or four years ago when the floods um, flooded a lot of uh, third and fourth tier um, manufacturers of automotive components and, and uh, uh, electronic components and shut the, uh, the supply down. It, it could be anything. But in any event, those are the sort of customers who more or less say to you in, the, in that mindset, look, I don't care what we talked about yesterday or whether I was sensitive to price yesterday. I've got a major problem now. Come in and fix it. And as I said, uh, those sorts of customers generally stay in that condition only as long uh, as the problem is there. Once the solution is there, uh, they will move back into there earlier. So that's why we, we talk about dynamic uh, customers and dynamic supply chains because any of the other customers in any of those collaborative mindsets or transactional mindset or dynamic mindset in a given condition in a marketplace can move into that um, innovative solutions mindset and afterwards can move back. And that's been one of the problems I think that we've not really understood in the way when we've been designing our supply chains. We've been treating it a bit like duck shooting where um, you know a customer comes towards us they change their buying behaviour from the last time we saw them. We try to we have our one size fits all. We create exceptions. We try to move around and and align with that customer that's moving. And creating all those exceptions creates all sorts of costs. And if we have too many of them, uh, then of course it it blows our whole business. So you can see which way I'm going here. What I'm actually arguing is, and when we talk about flexibility, it's not about twisting and turning a single. Uh, supply chain configuration. It's about understanding the structure of our market, which is sort of shown on the right-hand side of that diagram, and then reverse engineering back uh, so that we actually have supply chain configurations put together in recipes in different combinations of processes and KPIs and, and physical pathways, which actually line up with those, those particular segments. And so that as customers move up and down those buying behaviours, we just engage a different, uh, a different uh, supply chain configuration. So in summary, um, I guess the major finding for me has been to understand that um, we've got these four uh, supply chain configurations at minimum. There are times we find five. I've discovered a new one fairly recently. It's been around a long time informally, but it's we're now starting to formally recognise it, and that's what I call the accumulation supply chain, which is one where we use in major projects, but I'm not going to go into that today. 
And that's a sort of a, a sideways diagram, if you like. I'm an engineer, so I like to look at um, pictures and that's like a cross section of a pipe. And as you have fluid flowing through that pipe, depending on the different buying behaviours that you can see, starting with the bottom where you've got that very flat um, uh, flow type because it's very predictable what we're doing with our collaborative customers. It's a little less predictable for those transactional customers and then it becomes almost impossible to predict the surge effect we get on the right-hand side there against our red customers and our yellow customers. And the problem is that those laminar flows are all mixed together uh, in our supply chains and unless we can decouple them, um, then it's going to be very difficult to work out how to, to service our customer base. This is a, a great example. I know you like your beer in South Africa um, and other places. We like it in China as well. We like it in, uh, in Australia. Uh, and the major beer companies around the world for too long, I think, have been using what I call institutional um, segmentation, where they look at uh, selling beer to uh, suburban hotels, five-star hotels, uh, national retailers, nightclubs, uh, clubs, restaurants, airlines, and you know you might have 15 or 16 segments, too many. Uh, what this new method of segmentation allows you to do is to say, hey, I can show you a major hotel, uh, a major club, and uh, a major retailer that all buy beer the same way. Um, and it may be the low cost um, approach where they buy regular volumes at the lowest price, which is that big A one in the middle. So you can cut through complexity, and I think that's a word I haven't mentioned so far, but it's one of the underlying uh, motivations for my work, and that is how do we reduce the complexity? Well, one way of doing it is not by looking on the inside of the business initially and then looking up and trying to connect with customers. The real way to reduce uh, complexity is to reduce complexity in the marketplace, the way the world looks uh, at, at the way they want to buy products and services and then take that reduction in complexity, complexity and uh, transfer it inside into the business. So it's, it's getting the head of the dog right. It's, it's understanding our customers and the way they're structured. The same is true of services and banking, financial services, insurance, it doesn't matter. Um, wherever customers are buying products and services, we need to uh, understand the structure in that particular marketplace. Having done that, we can then go to the next level and, and I'm, I'll move through this fairly quickly, but uh, again, what I've understood is that if you're in logistics or procurement or the broader supply chain part of your business, you can't do every, you can't service the customer on your own. Customers buy in total. They buy the product, they buy the pricing of that product. They buy the service that, you, what, that goes with it. They buy the things we do in production, the way we shape the product. They, they buy the uh, ongoing relationship. So in a sense, uh, customers buy the whole lot. And this is a good way of looking at it, that if you take collaborative customers on the right here and we take our vertical functions there, then in fact, our, those collaborative customers buy uh, a bit of everything across our organisation to get that end result. Now, for collaborative customers who are being serviced by a continuous replenishment supply chain, the value proposition is very much that we're going to give you a good, reliable service. It's going to be the same all the time. It's very assured. You can be assured that uh, um, we won't let you down, and that's essentially what they buy or people who buy branded product. And, and the sorts of things, therefore, that they look for is you know, against those dimensions of things like, uh, uh, you know, they buy branded product. Uh, innovation is more about uh, the, the uh, you know, improving the relationship as we work our way down that list. Pricing is not a big issue with these sorts of customers. They don't mind paying a premium. Production is uh, generally lowish volume, but high value add. Capacity considerations are not a big issue here because we can forecast pretty accurately what we're buying. So these customers, once you know them, are pretty easy to service. As you move to the lean, um, lean customers who are looking for reliability and low price, it's a different value proposition. So the same functions in the business have to contribute slightly differently to give a consistent quality product delivered reliably at the lowest price. And here, we use the same dimensions of strategy, but the answers are different. 
Uh, these people are looking for lowest price. They're looking for efficiency. Uh, we can hope to get high utilisation out of our factories and, and, and DCs, um, but the relationship's going to be a low relationship one. As we move towards uh, the dynamic segment, same idea again, but the value proposition here is more about uh, emphasis on time and managing capacity. And that's what comes through in our, in our strategies. And finally, the fully flexible supply chain, uh, which is servicing these innovative solutions uh, segment, are looking for um, you know, rapid innovative solutions to major unplanned distortions or disruptions that they've had in their supply chain. And this requires a different sort of approach, um, very different to the ones we talked about earlier. So just wanted to get across to you here that it's, it's not about creating all sorts of exceptions. It's about having a whole lot of things that we do and we just combine them in different ways and different recipes to deliver uh, along particular uh, supply chains. The third level of the model I talked about is about culture and it's a, it, it plays into this and I, I think I'm one of the few people in the world who sort of talk about culture in the same breath as supply chain but it's, it, I'm convinced that unless we can uh, solve uh, this problem of where all the forces of darkness exist in organisations, we're not really going to move, uh, move the whole uh, performance of our supply chains forward. Here we're talking about being able to see certain behaviours above the water but below most of what goes on, uh, the values and beliefs and underlying assumptions which come together as in, in, in individuals and then are combined to make up the, the culture of the business. Now, I'm not going to go into this in great detail because you will get this particular uh, CD, but the, the, again, matching what we've spoken about already, the right-hand side top is where we have that innovative culture versus the bottom left hand, which is the conventional culture of hierarchies and systems. The bottom right hand there is the culture or subculture of time and urgency versus the top left hand, which is the culture where the emphasis is, is relationships. And these subcultures inside businesses are all type of competing against each other and it's a question of where the centre of gravity is and indeed is it possible to create uh, and coexist a number of different subcultures because if you can't you won't be able to deliver all those four or five supply chains that I talked about before. Then the question becomes how do we actually shape um, the subcultures in our business and again We've got a pretty straightforward uh, list there. You, you, there's only 13 or 14 things you can do. Uh, you can change your organisation design. You can move people around. You can uh, combine processes in different ways. I've given you a list down that, uh, down that middle there right through to the leadership style. And depending on whether you're trying to shape the culture, which subculture which underpins the collaborative supply chain or continuous replenishment supply chain versus the lean supply chain, the agile supply chain, or the fully flexible supply chain, so also do you need to do different things here. I'm not going to go through them in great detail now. I'll mention a few of them. For instance, uh, one of the things that I've found very important um, over the last three or four years to try to grip, come to grips with is this question of organisation design. Because as I said earlier, we, we, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of our vertical uh, functions, and we need those specialisms. But on their own, they're not going to be able to give us that horizontal uh, response to our customers on the right-hand side. Uh, here I've just given an example of uh, what we do. We, we can second people out of uh, the different functions like procurement, production, finance, um, and develop clusters on the left-hand side there. And we can match those clusters with the customers or the segments on the right-hand side. Um, so there's two things going on here. We, we're, we're seconding people, putting them in multidisciplinary clusters of up to 50 or 60 people. Um, we are also trying to embed in these clusters the required bias. So in this particular case where we're looking at either major single customers or groups of customers who have got a bias towards relationship, then we are trying to embed this, this, a similar bias in the way we, we, we put together these clusters and that's why I talk a lot about how we can genetically engineer our, our, our organisation structures. And then 
when people are in those particular clusters servicing uh, the customers in this way, uh, drawing on the specialisms in the middle, uh, they will report to someone else. And when they move back 12 months later, back into their functions to you know, be retrained and to be updated, uh, then they report back to their original uh, executives. So it's not a matrix organisation. It's, um, it, it, it has to have those two dimensions. So, and the other, I think, important thing here to, to, to state is, is technology, that we'll never get our ERP systems uh, to, to do everything. They can't differentiate the different requirements uh, and different responses. But what we can do is put an ERP system in uh, as a foundation and then build different um, applications on the top. So in this particular example, where we're lining up with the collaborative uh, customers, we definitely need a CRM system. Whereas when we get across to talk about the uh, demanding customers, the dynamic customers in the red, we probably wouldn't bother putting a CRM there because they're the customers that come and go. So just understanding those things are important. And as we go through with Lean, we'd have, again, uh, different, uh, different responses in the way we shape. We'd have different KPIs, uh, we, 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 in terms of organisation structure, we'd still use our clusters, but we'd, those clusters would be built around processes this time coming together to form uh, the least cost best solution. Uh, the technologies would, uh, combinations would be different. Um, as we move into the agile supply chain, again, same sorts of dimensions, but different responses. Here we're looking for speed, so the KPIs would be absolute speed, whereas in the KPIs in, the, in say, the collaborative, um, for the collaborative supply chain was very much about retaining customers. And, um, and, and in a sense, this is a great way to epitomise uh, what an organisation structure is in this type of supply chain. This is, this is like Zara, uh, where they're not so much worried about the, the numbers in the organisation, they're more concerned about speed and, 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 and having capacity to absorb uh, the, the, the volatility in the marketplace. And this, I think, is the type of organisation structure we're going to see more of. And it's not an organisation structure that's going to give you the lowest cost, but it's going to give you the best result for those customers who are prepared to pay for fashion, for speed, for quick response. And finally, the extreme speed and delivering um, uh, solutions like this as the fully flexible supply chain, and uh, they tend to be uh, where more part-time activities where people are pre-programmed to come together when there's an emergency in the company and form a project team to solve that particular emergency. And, and finally, the fourth level in the whole model is uh, really the uh, idea of leadership. And again, matching up with everything I've said before, there's different types of leadership styles, the visionary on the top right hand side, the more traditional leader on the bottom left, uh, the company um, baron uh, on the bottom right and the coach top left. And what I'm arguing here is depending on the sorts of supply chains we're running with, we need to put people in charge of those who, who have the appropriate biases depending on the type of supply chain, the type of customer. And, you know, if you use Myers-Briggs as a method of, of, of um, uh, if you like, assessing your style, we've got um, a translation from Myers-Briggs into our PADI style as well. So it really, to summarise this whole thing, we're really talking about out there in the world pretty much four different supply chain configurations. There will, from time to time, be a different combination of, of, of these four or five out of the 16, but generally no more than that. And it, and it does mean that you've got to look more closely at you know, the segmentation, your processes, your technology, and combine them in different ways. Now, of course, I know most of you in this audience um, are coming from the supply base, and everything I've said so far about customers relates also to the reverse end, which is looking back towards the supply base. Again, the problem I find with, uh, uh, with uh, procurement uh, people is that they've tended to be use conventional methods of segmenting their uh, supply base, uh, just as marketing people have tended to do with their customer base. This is not appropriate, uh, and suffice to say, we've done the work with uh, many organisations looking at their supply base, and we've found similar, um, similar types of buying behaviour 
uh, or in this case we'll call it selling behaviour, um, expectations uh, in the supply base. And it's not un- not surprising, quite frankly, because these people are human, and we tend to find that you know there's the trusted, reliable suppliers, there's the there's the process-driven supplier, there's the uh, planned creativity supply, there's the opportunistic supplier. And again, if you know who's who, you can use them in appropriate ways. We've got a great example here, which uh, we looked at in the Brazilian um, um, uh, meat industry, where we had a major processor uh, looking back at their supply base, getting a, a supply of, of uh, um, live cattle. And uh, the procurement answer was, we'll just go pay more money to get more cattle. Uh, The answer wasn't that because we looked and we went and did the work um, amongst the cattle ranchers and when we did our segmentation we found that something like uh, I think it was 89% of the ranchers that we surveyed were interested in non-price things like you know the the, the talkative ones just wanted partnership and long-term contracts. The traditionalists were looking for sort of uh, help in getting better yield from their cattle and their e-ranchers were looking for market information and help with technology. And it was only the middle group there, what we call the suspicious group, I think it was uh, something like 19% uh, that, that really wanted the money as you would get in an auction. So bring this whole thing to a close, what I'm really arguing for is that if we do our segmentation at the customer end, do a similar segmentation at the supply end, uh, we've got a four by four there. That means we've got up to 16 different uh, types of combinations of pathway. Uh, it looks like this in the middle. Uh, in the middle, of course, you've got your own organisation. Uh, what I'd be arguing is that you build clusters of people uh, who can handle uh, that, who have been attuned to looking after, uh, in the, if you take the bottom example there, uh, that cluster looks after the collaborative customers on the right, but also the trusted advisor collaborative uh, 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 suppliers on the left. Um, and But those particular clusters also talk to each other inside the business. And in fact, the reality is, is that you very rarely have any straight through supply chains. You actually have combinations. So if you take someone like Zara, who tend to deal uh, at the front end with very agile, demanding uh, customers on the right, they could easily be buying uh, uh, their product or raw material like fabrics uh, in markets like Sri Lanka and India on the left uh, and using lean tactics where they would bring in product in one way, low cost, and then shift it uh, into their production facilities as required and then go through a very quick production process once the designs have been decided and then use an agile on their own. So you've got this type of hybrid approach, uh, which uh, I think is the way to go. And if we understand that, we can start playing those tunes. And in my book, I give examples of all 16 uh, possible uh, different combinations of supply and demand. So in, in the end, we're, we're, we're left with this labyrinth that we've got to find our way through. I hope my discussion with you today is has given you a bit of a new compass to work your way through it um, and that the book that you're going to be given out um, uh, through the sponsorship uh, of um, the organisers of um, Smart Procure World, um, that uh, you will be able to dip into this more deeply and get some enjoyment out of starting to understand how to design your supply chains of the future. Thank you very much. 